Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Vince Lackner. My mother, Judy Lackner, was librarian here for 22 years. She was hired by Jim Cavalier in 1966. She's 98 years old. <laughs> 98 years old, she's here today in the back. She would love to tell two brief stories about Jim. for a job here, and this was 1966, I was ushered into Jim Cavalier's office, and already I felt as if there was something nice about this. And when Jim came in and we had a chat, I just fell for him the way everybody fell for him. And he was just, um, what I liked was that he would not tolerate anything mean or nasty or evil. <laughs> But he let the kids be kids, and he was just always there to help out any place, any way he could. So I think everybody here has probably benefited from being in touch with him. Just being in touch with him for a year or so would give you a whole new attitude toward school. So it's wonderful to see you all here, and I'm glad I could make it. I could make it because I have a nice son who got me here in my wheelchair and all, but I just wanted to say hi, and I'm glad to see you all. Thank you. Good afternoon, friends and welcome to this very special event celebrating the life of Mr. Jim Cavalier. My name is Whitney Snyder, and at this time I'd like to introduce to you Mr. Jim Darby, whose son David is the class of 85, and whose wife Debbie worked here in communications. Mr. Darby will offer his reflections of Mr. Cavalier. Jimmy Cavalier was a teacher, a great one. Among other things, he taught Latin, and upon first meeting him, I couldn't help thinking back to my first brush with that subject at the same school he once taught for. Except my Latin teacher then was a wizened, testy character who, in introducing himself, wrote his name on the blackboard in large block letters then turned to pace the class with this timeless introduction. My name is, <coughs> this is Latin 101. You will find this subject extremely difficult. <laughs> I could only think, oh my Lord, why not just give me an F now and save us all a waste of time? <laughs> the class went downhill from there. Many years later, upon hearing this sad tale, Jim said, how about these words you say every day? He then proceeded to give me several words we all use in our most basic vocabulary. He then used half a dozen words where Latin provided the basic root in meaning or construction. See, he said, you already know how to speak Latin. I could only think that the whole course of my life might have changed if I had this kind man for my Latin teacher. Jim Cavalier was a natural and fantastic teacher at the core of his whole being. Despite not being a huge of stature, Jimmy was a darn good athlete and played basketball in high school before coaching it at the academy. He had a great ongoing interest in sports generally and was an avid Pirates fan. Bob Gray tells of the times he and several others would take in a Pirates game with Jim, and to their in interest, Jim would concentrate on recording every detail of the game on a scorecard. He kept score like a professional. 
At the end of the game, they were surprised when he did not take this work home with him. Jim was just fascinated with the intellectual challenge of keeping score in a professional manner without wishing to then keep any of his work for posterity. Obviously, an overriding intellectual curiosity was at the core of his approach to baseball and also to a great many other things. I also know Jim in the very important capacity of being a teacher and school administrator for one of my kids. Since others are covering this basic aspect of his life, I'll not go further except to remember the many times I heard my son's classmates talk about Mr. Cav, either in carpools or watching soccer games. Their talk was almost in almost reverential and always loving terms. You can't fool high school age kids. Mr. Cav was a very special person to them. One of the stories that Jim liked to relate concerned a highly esteemed and well-regarded CEO of a huge local Pittsburgh corporation who was worried about how his son was doing in school and wanted to talk with Jim. While he was voicing his concerns, Jim Ban began to softly smile with those twinkly eyes of his and nearly chuckled. This somewhat surprised the parent to whom Jim noted that the conversa this conversation reminded him almost exactly of a meeting he had had with another parent many years earlier on many of the same topics. After reassuring this father that his son was really doing quite well in all the intellectual and social aspects of the school, Jim then went on to relate the name of that previous parent in that meeting so long ago. It was the CEO's own father. Not only was Jim Cavalier a wonderful friend, he was a tremendous comfort to this anxious guy whose son was under Mr. Cav's care in school. How many graduates have been carefully steered to the appropriate colleges by this man? He knew the strengths and weaknesses of his students like no one else. Whether it was in playing tennis on a warm summer's afternoon, whitewater rafting on the Yakagani, where after spilling out of a raft in the turbulent stream, we anxiously caught up to Jim, clutching onto a rock around the next bend, or driving back from a soccer practice and overhearing the kids reliving the latest doings of Mr. Cav at the academy. Jim Cavalier was a constant, wonderful presence in all of our lives. If you could wish that your kid grew up to be like someone you knew, it would be like Mr. Cav. He was, just simply, a wonderful, extraordinary human being. Dr. Susan Sauer is an Academy graduate, class of 55, and a longtime vital contributor to our alumni office. Her children went to SA during the Cavalier years, and she worked with Mr. Cav for 20 years in alumni relations. Dr. Sauer will take you through Mr. Cav's time here at the Academy. It's my profound privilege to talk about Jim Cavalier's career at the school. It's a long and proud history. His influence on decades of alumni cannot be overemphasized. And many of you are here, about 140 today, to remember him with love and respect. There's so many wonderful anecdotes that he loved to tell about people and events from all those years, and he especially loved to talk about the early years. 
how Cliff Nichols entrusted him to embrace new thinking about a high school, a different model from the conventional one, how team member Mary Robb in particular helped formulate the philosophy of personal initiative and responsibility for handling much more freedom that then was typical, and how horrified many parents were by those same freedoms that the team allowed the older kids to have. No study halls? Throw a ball anytime you weren't in class? Walk into town for lunch? Unthinkable. And how critics thought the new high school would never make it, and how delighted he was to prove them wrong. Not to mention how thrilled he was when our first varsity soccer team beat Shadyside Academy. At least one member of that team is here. I'm pleased to say that we've captured many of his stories in his own words, which you will be able to read when we publish the history of SA Senior School this coming spring. And I regret deeply that he's not here to see that. From the beginning, Jim instituted so many activities and opportunities that made the school special and continue to this day. The May program was a particular favorite and special events like the Cum Laude Society inductions. Running a high school was not easy, especially during times like the Vietnam War, the drug culture, and the hippie movement. In imitation of the students at Columbia and other universities nationwide, this student takeover included Deb Cantor, Scott Ferguson, Rob Walkingshaw, Debbie Erb, Nancy Stevens. Mr. Cab loved it. He told me, those were all the top kids at the school. They were the leaders, the best students. How many alumni have said through the years, he changed my life. Without Mr. Cav's help, I never would have had the opportunities that have made me what I am today. He and college counselor Scott Carter, another key player on the original team, put Swickley on the map in college admissions offices all over the country. And he was the consummate teacher. Who here can still conjugate the verb amo to love? This is audience participation. Are you ready? Here we go. Amo, amas, amat, amamas, amatis, amad. Good work. And who always uses the words for alumni correctly? He was a stickler for that. I'm an alumna, Whitney's an alumnus, we are alumni. Yes, the Latin is ni, the English is I. Morning announcements. This is a place where a sense of humor would often shine through. And he loved it when students or teachers would come up with something crazy, something off the wall, a song or a story that would make everybody laugh. That shared humor helped foster the strong sense of community within the school that characterized the 25 year influence that he had. Here's the administrative team for many years here, Al Dugan, of course, was an integral part of that team before Joe Zalewski. Mr. Cab loved sports. He loved playing them, he loved watching them, and he loved coaching them, which he did for years. And even though it was always important to give everybody a chance to play, don't think for a moment that he didn't love to win. In 1989, he stepped down from heading the senior school. The faculty presented him with this autographed photo, among other expressions of love and respect. 
For the next three years, he moved into the positions of assistant head of school for Ham Clark and became the first director of alumni relations. He organized an alumni office, established an alumni council, and began the tradition of annual reunions that continues today. After he retired from the academy in 1992, he did not retire from education. He spent years as an admissions counselor at Carnegie Mellon University, continuing to stay active in local, regional, and national college counseling organizations, which is actually where I first met him in the early 1970s. And he continued to take an active part in alumni relations here at SA. He was always present for our reunions and our holiday parties. He loved to travel to the regional get-togethers and participate in anything that involved alumni of the school. He would come into our office to prepare for each event. Show me the list, he'd say. And if there was a name on it that he wasn't sure of, and there were very few of those, he'd take a yearbook off the shelf and sit down and study. His mastery of your names and faces, all you alumni here today, and interesting, sometimes quite telling stories that he could talk about your time here was unequal. He had a truly amazing memory, which sprang from the fact that he really knew you, each of you, during the years that he was your principal. He knew you and he cared. He continued to attend special assemblies and any major event at the school. Here he is helping to break ground for the Hanson Library. And here he is being presented with an essay diploma as an honorary member of the first graduating class, the class of 1966, 50 years later. What is his legacy here at our school? It has two parts. First, the bricks and mortar, the tangibles. The Cavalier house where he lived and raised his family was dedicated in 2017 and now serves as the offices and reception area for the alumni and advancement departments. And the Cavalier room in Hanson Library where this portrait hangs and where you will have lunch today. And then there are the intangibles, the living legacy that touches the hearts of our students here. The Cavalier House team, students from all four grades who engage in healthy, happy, year-long competition for the coveted House Cup. They all have shirts that proudly read Cavalier and students who get the opportunity to attend our school because of the James E. Cavalier Scholarship. And students who aspire to and meet the standards of the Cavalier Cup each year. It was first given to Jim in 1966 for his leadership, guidance, and inspiration, and is awarded to a senior with a record of combined excellence in scholarship, sportsmanship, and citizenship, and is therefore designated by the faculty as the best all-around graduate. This tribute is read to Jim every year. Dingy Hayes, who's here today, was the first student to receive that award. And his legacy lives in the hearts of all of you who had the good fortune to be a student during those 25 years. And so we say today, from the hearts of his former students and from a grateful school, Awe Atque Wale, hail and farewell our beloved Mr. Cav, requiesque in pace aeterna. May you rest in eternal peace.
as you know, before Mr. Cav came to Swickley Academy, he spent time at Shadyside Academy, where he had a positive influence on all of his students. One of those individuals was Bill Lieberman, who was an advisee of Mr. Cav's. Bill said that despite not being an athlete or a good student, Mr. Cav mentored him well. In 1983, many years after Bill had graduated from Shadyside, Bill drove by Swickley Academy one day and decided to stop in and say hi to Mr. Cav. When Bill, who was casually dressed that day, entered the school, he ran into our headmaster, Mr. Cliff Nichols. Mr. Nichols told him that Mr. Cav was on vacation. So Bill asked Mr. Nichols, what was the cost of a full scholarship all the way up through the senior school? After Mr. Nichols responded, Bill said that he'd like to start a scholarship in Mr. Cav's name and would send half the amount the very next day. Apparently, Mr. Nichols was very polite but not terribly enthusiastic. Bill later learned that Mr. Nichols called Mr. Cav and said, quote, hey, Jim, do you know a guy named Lieberman? Once Mr. Nichols received Bill's check, he called and asked Bill to return. Mr. Nichols admitted that he was somewhat skeptical when they first met. The next thing Bill knew, they were having their picture taken by a Swickley Herald photographer, and that's how the James E. Cavalier Scholarship was established. Bill went on to say that when he chaired St. Francis Hospital, Mr. Cav gave him Catholic-inspired guidance, and later Bill gave Mr. Cav the Jewish guidance needed to help raise Mr. Cavalier's granddaughters. Here's a brief video from Bill Lieberman, who called Mr. Cav a great influence in his life. Good afternoon, Pat, Teresa, Lisa, Carolyn, and uh, appropriate grandchildren. Uh, my name is Bill Lieberman, and I've had a relationship with Jim uh, for over 55 years, although there were 20 of those years that we didn't see each other. He was both a, men he be he was a mentor to me and my advisor when I was at Shadyside. Uh, later years, he became my dear friend. Uh, we had lunch together two or three times a year for about 35 years, uh, and we always treasured seeing each other. I will miss him. I miss him every day. I miss talking to him. And he was a blessing for all of us. And I hope all of you, uh, when you think about all the good things in life, one of, the, one of the things that you'll think of is your relationship with Jim Cavalier. He was a blessing. And, and I just want to say to Pat and Teresa, Lisa, and Carolyn, and the kids, we're all lucky to have known him uh, and the fact that he was a great part of our lives uh, will something that uh, will be so meaningful for me forever. <clears throat> so here we are back in Ray Auditorium, the place where we all graduated from Swickley Academy. If you close your eyes for a moment, you can see Cliff Nichols and Whitney Snyder shaking hands and handing out diplomas right after each senior's name is read to the audience by Jim Cavalier, head of the senior school. What an honor it is for me as one of Mr. Cav's kids to stand before you today and share my thoughts about this special man, one of the finest individuals whom I have ever met. All you had to ever say were two words, Mr. Cav. And no matter who you might be talking to, would be sure to smile. It was a tremendous blessing for all of us that Mr. Cav decided to leave Shadyside in the early 60s and come to Swickley Academy to start the senior school. There was no way that any of us would even consider going away to some random boarding school. We all wanted Mr. Cav and his full senior school experience. He had so many talents, ballroom dance instructor, teacher, coach, and college advisor to go along well with being the inspirational founder and heart and soul of our senior school. He was a visionary who was way ahead of his time and an educator who was not afraid to think outside of the box. His May program gave us the chance to take classes that were not your typical academic subjects. He taught one course called How to Survive in College. Despite the fact that I was unable to properly fry an egg, 
or successfully do laundry, Mr. Cab was still kind enough to give me a passing grade. I'm sure all of us remember hurrying past Dean of Students, Larry Hall, so that we could get into the library by 8.30 a.m. for our daily morning announcements. Mr. Cab wanted us to stand up next to him at the podium and share with the senior school student body what the latest good news was about our various teams, clubs, and activities. He wanted us to use this public speaking platform to gain confidence in ourselves and show others what we were passionate about. You see, Mr. Cav's senior school was defined by academic excellence and plenty of school spirit. He showed us by his enthusiastic daily interactions that it's all about relationships. We could always tell that he thought each and every one of us really mattered. One day during the spring of my junior year, Mr. Cav called me into his office and suggested that I teach tennis as one of my May program courses. I had never taught or ever considered teaching tennis at that time, but if Mr. Cav thought it was a good idea, then I was gonna do it. On the very first day, I politely asked the class to please run a lap around just one court. I was shocked when two girls, who were both good friends of mine, each gave me the finger for making them run a lap. Later that day, I headed into Mr. Cav's office and I said, how do I handle this? What do I do? He laughed and said, Whitney, all you have to do is encourage them a little bit and you'll be surprised by how well they respond. What great advice this was from him, the ultimate encourager. Mr. Cav was a role model to me personally. His Christian values were always on display. He spent time with me and went out of his way to help. In recent years, I had the opportunity to share Mr. Cav with our girls and boys Swickley Academy varsity tennis teams. He would drive down to Nichols Field and quietly take a seat under a tree in the shade. I would bring our kids over to him, introduce them, and then just watch the magic occur. With a twinkle in his eyes, he would connect with them just like he did with me many years ago. Mr. Cav, an absolute treasure to all of us. And as he would say at the end of morning announcements, we're off. <clears throat> we all know how much Mr. Cav loved his family, and so now here's his oldest daughter, Teresa, to speak to you about her dad. need this. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today, both in person and via live stream. I think we have some people uh, listening at home. Before I begin, there is one person that I must thank for so much, Susan Sauer. Without her, Without her, this event would not have happened. No one here can possibly imagine the time and energy she devoted to every detail involved and the patience with which she addressed issues as they arose. Many other members of Susan's team and the other Academy staff assisted with this memorial and we are so grateful for their help. Susan, my father loved working with you at the Academy and considered you a dear friend. Your efforts to honor his memory mean the world to our entire family. I also want to preference my remarks by noting that I am speaking on behalf of my family. The thoughts that follow are a compilation of memories and emotions gathered from my sisters, Carolyn and Elisa, my niece, Francesca, my two daughters, Sarah and Natalie, and my husband, Mark. We all feel blessed that we had so many wonderful years with my father, and we miss him every day. Whether you knew him as Jim or Mr. Cav, my father was a special person to all of us. His kindness, patience, good humor, and willingness to help others are just some of the reasons 
that my father is someone we won't forget. He was a man who found pleasure in simple things. When I would ask dad what he wanted for Christmas or his birthday, he would respond, all I want is peace and quiet and a kind word. He gave that same answer year after year, always hopeful. Yet, I think that peace and quiet may not have been in the cards with three daughters. Dad was supremely happy just reading a good book, listening to jazz or classical music, or fishing in a quiet spot, never really caring whether he caught anything. Dad always told the story of how, as a new teacher, he was called in by his principal and told that he had to learn to control his temper or he would never make it as a teacher. I never believed this story. What temper? I don't know what mindfulness techniques Dad practiced or hypnosis he underwent to change his ways, but I always have considered my father one of the most even-tempered people I have ever known. One time at an Academy High School basketball game, I did hear my dad screaming at a ref, implying that he might need glasses. It was shocking. <laughs> I will always think of my father as a Renaissance man. Although he had zero aptitude for business and home repairs, he loved languages and literature, valued a liberal arts education, and enjoyed all kinds of music. He even made a heroic, yet unsuccessful, effort to learn to play the piano after he retired. My father was a man of faith, and he felt blessed that St. James provided him with a religious home for more than 50 years. And then there were sports. What a sports fan. In his youth, my father enjoyed playing basketball and tennis. In his later years, he loved taking mulligans with his golf buddies and fishing in Naples. Steelers games were a family event, eliciting screams of joy or cries of desperation. My father particularly loved basketball, and he truly cherished the years that he coached the senior school girls basketball team at the academy. He would talk about those experiences so often, laughing about how the women paid much more attention to his instruction than the men ever did. Even though my father was calm and even-handed, he was also tough and determined. I'd like to relate some examples of things in his life that exemplify for me his strength and tenacity. First, he and his five brothers and sisters grew up in a family of very modest means. After his parents separated, Dad and his brother Joey attended and boarded at a seminary run by the Christian brothers. Dad was 14 years old. After graduating from Catholic University, the Christian brothers sent my father to teach at an orphanage for troubled boys. It was there that he first learned to appreciate each child for their strengths and how to handle every prank and snarky retort that a student could throw his way. As a young newlywed, Dad had to work hard to support his family. While at Shadyside Academy, he moonlighted by teaching at Mrs. Bergwin's dancing school. It was great. Dad made extra money while helping many young men overcome their fear of asking a girl to dance. My father's move to Swickley Academy from Shadyside was an act of pure bravery or perhaps delusion. Cliff Nichols asked Dad to start the senior school when many in the community thought that it couldn't be done. He had to move to a new community, hire faculty and staff, prepare a curriculum, and support a group of students and parents that he was meeting for the first time. He would be the first to say that it never would have happened without the incredible support of Cliff Nichols, Whitney Snyder, Myrta McDonald, Scott Carter, and so many, many others. Dad was a fighter. He fought for his faculty. He made sure that they were respected, that their concerns were heard, that their curriculum ideas were considered, and that any complaints were fairly addressed. This must have required keen advocacy skills, Solomonic decision-making, and an unwavering desire to do what was best for the school. Dad also fought for his students. 
He recognized the strengths and abilities in each student, and he refused to let them be bullied, disrespected, or overlooked. As the college guidance counselor at the school, Dad fought tooth and nail to find the college that would be the best fit for each student. He called college admissions officers, and he advocated for students that he believed in. He left no stone unturned. Dad sometimes had to tell parents that their children were not God's gift to the earth. This was always a difficult message to deliver. Only one of Dad's, uh, one of Dad's career long goals was to broaden racial and economic diversity at Swickley Academy in a way that was not divisive but fostered respect. He worked assiduously to increase the enrollment of students from outside the Swickley community and retain those students. He ranging for bus service, providing counseling, and seeking funds for those in need of financial assistance. As you've heard, Bill Lieberman honored my father by establishing a scholarship fund in his name. Many of you have contributed to this fund, and the endowment will keep my father's memory alive. Thank you for that. In his later years, Dad courageously strove to overcome multiple medical issues. Even in his 90s, he went to the YMCA and faithfully did his exercises. He would walk each day and take great joy in his progress. He would pop into the alumni office to check in and see how things were going. Good friends called religiously to make sure that he was not slacking off and would invite him to go out for lunch or watch a game at Nichols Field, making sure that he got up and out. This emotional support really kept him going. On a personal note, Dad understood that a loving family was not something you can take for granted. He grew up in a large family and cherished his brothers and sisters, Buddy, Joey, Paul, Mary Jane, and Sally. At home, Dad managed to live with five women his wife, three daughters, and his mother-in-law, and somehow he survived. I don't want to say that we tormented him, but uh, we did criticize his wardrobe an awful lot, monitored his diet, and made him wait at parties as we said farewells for over an hour. Dad eventually figured out that in order to avoid these delays, he needed to drive his own car to a party. He raised three girls who squabbled and had ups and downs, yet he never lost his temper. He guided and helped us uh, make our way, always with a loving hand. He cherished his grandchildren, Sarah, Natalie, and Francesca, and took great joy in their accomplishments. He also loved and cared for his mother-in-law, Teresa Hartley who lived with us for 25 years. He and she traveled to Italy together, without my mom, I might add, watched sports, and lived side by side in harmony for many years. My dad and mom were married for 63 years. It takes something very special to be together and weather life's highs and lows with unconditional love for so long. My father made me proud as he supported my mother in her efforts to go back to school and become a nurse practitioner. He never told the women in our family that there was a goal we could not achieve. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank my mother, who took such good care of my father throughout his life. Her medical knowledge and advocacy skills she, with them, she managed Dad's health issues with love and care and tenacity, and she made sure that we had him with us for as many years as possible. In closing, I want to thank you all for celebrating my father's life. We each were touched by his presence, and we are better because of it. To continue this celebration, please join us in the Hanson Library for lunch and thank you very much.